everybody. I'm Alessandra, uh, this is Lineker and Carlotta. We're with the UC Irvine, and um, you know the title of the session is called Soda Cookers Successes. And it's funny because we're still R&D, I'm a researcher, I'm a graduate student, uh, but I guess our success comes from the fact that we are the first and only so far uh, organization to be granted a uh, research grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So I guess I got us a lot of uh, attention, and that's why we're here today. Um, it started, I mean, I'll tell you a story of how it works. Um, it's, it started with a project uh, that a professor did at UCI looking into salts. And so he, he saw all the heat capacity and the, the heat of vaporization of the salts. He's like, well, we can use this in solar cookers. And the idea is, you know, we're all thermal, solar thermal energy for cooking, right? The sun has to be out. So what happens when the sun goes down and a lot of people want to cook dinner? And so Professor Garment thought, well, let's use these salts to <coughs> melt them using concentrated solar and then cook with them at night. This can address the versatility issue in terms of the duration um, during the day that you can actually cook using solar power. It's fantastic. It's a, it's a material that you can melt and then when it solidifies, that heat is released and that goes to your cooking. So that's what we've been working on and we're in the second phase of the project. This, you can see a picture. This is the first uh, design that Professor Garment and Lineker actually was with him when they uh, started that and they cooked bacon on it. Um, they cooked bacon on it and it uh, gave about the same energy that a microwave would if it was running for 30 minutes. So a little under three hours of cooking time. That was really exciting, and so we thought, okay, well, what can we do to extend the uh, cooking duration, um, improve the installations that we can use more like a thermal battery, say we, we charge it during the day when the sun's out and it's at its peak, and we just have a bunch of these uh, containers with our salt. And then what can we do with them? Can we store them and use them later? So that's what we have been working on now, and what Carlotta and Melinda will get into in their design process for this past year. So we wanted to, like I said, meet versatility. We wanted it to restore energy. We wanted it to um, be emission-free. And so this is what our research has been looking into. So we have some design constraints. Of course, we wanted to cook, right? So what better constraint than to see does it boil water? Um, also, we wanted to kind of, you know, the different things at play here. It has to be cheap. It has to work. Uh, has to be efficient. Uh, so these are the different things we have looked at in our design and make sure that every part of our design kind of had a little trade-off so that we could get the best uh, that we could out of what we were making, such as the insulation and the containing material, the ratio of the salts, because it's not just one salt, it's a mixture of salts, which whenever we're going into later. So the idea here is we put some salts into a container, we melt them in a concentrator, and then they solidify and they cook. But what does that container look like? Um, you know, a lot of you are technically savvy and engineers, and we know that not all shapes have the same volume or surface area. So we looked at surface area and volume ratios to determine which one was the best for what we were trying to achieve, which was good heat retention and heat loss through the surface. And we found that a truncated, truncated sphere would be a really good thing to look into in our design, and that's what we're currently building now, and we'll show you pictures of it later. Um, and so it's essentially a sphere with the top part cut off, and that flat part is going to be your cooking surface. So inside of the sphere is the molten salt. And it's a closed container, and then we put that under the concentrator, and the concentrator would melt the salt, and the salt would then be used to cook with, and as it solidifies, it becomes so we looked into, you know, spheres, rectangles, uh, cylinders, and we found that this was the best. This is what we are going with now. And so the next step was, okay, well, we know what uh, geometry would be best to keep the heat and to cook with. So what can we do to keep that heat and from just going off and concentrate it into just the cooking surface? So Carlotta's going to go over the insulation design.
lot of the revamping of the first prototype. And um, the Gates Foundation, they're very interested in looking at supporting these developing countries and how can we um, achieve sustainability goals, um, serve the local needs. So we really tried to adopt some of those goals into our own goals. And uh, that came through uh, in insulation. And so previously what we had had was we had used a Broxel 80 mineral wool fiber. Um, it's a synthetic insulation and maybe not so easy to handle. You have to have uh, safety precautions. And we had used that um, in the first rectangular stove to cook our bacon. But now we wanted to look at what other options were out there that were maybe more natural, local, um, something that people in these developing worlds would have easy access to so that they could um, build their own stoves. And so we, we looked at a variety of different types of insulation, um, some synthetic ones, but also some natural ones. So sheep spool, denim, cotton, clay even. And we looked at like how big that insulation would have to be, what did it, um, what were the maximum temperatures, the cost, how heavy was this going to be? And um, we found that the sheep school um, offered a lot of promise because it was uh, comparable to uh, what was being provided by our previous uh, Roxel 80 uh, mineral fiber insulation. Um, and some of the benefits of the sheep school was that you know, it had the lower cost, it was lightweight, um, much safer for people to handle, could be locally produced, it was a natural material, and then uh, more environmentally friendly. So then what we did was we, we looked at how we could um, support more local needs in terms of what they were cooking. So previously we had, we had set our design goal to be boiling water, and we had tested cooking bacon, but um, we want to look at what are the local people doing. So um, we targeted India for our project, and um, there they cooked chapati. So we decided we want to build a stove that would be good for cooking chapati. And so to do that, we, we need to figure out, well, how much energy are we going to need in our stove to cook chapati? One meal at night, then the energy, um, there's heat loss over the night, and then still be able to cook another meal in the morning when it's dark. And so um, we did some calculations on that to figure out what was the minimum energy we would need. And then from there, how much salt would we need and how much insulation would we need to accommodate a certain amount of heat loss throughout the night. Um, and so we did uh, quite a few calculations on that and that really helped um, navigate us towards our, uh, our size specifications. And so, um, here you can see that we have a very different type of stove design from the previous uh, rectangular box. Um, the first one's a cross-sectional view, so these dimensions were guided by those calculations that we had done on how much energy would be needed and how much insulation. And then you can see an exploded view. So um, as Alexander had mentioned, we have a truncated sphere um, thermal energy battery, and we're, we're just holding that um, with the support structure and then we are surrounding it with the insulation, and then we will uh, we have it in a cylindrical casing so that it's easy to transport. And then uh, on the uh, far left, you can see a picture of um, our most recent uh, development with this. So um, the truncated sphere on top is a really shiny surface right now, and then um, the wool insulation is not full, but um, that's so that you can see the support structure. And we we're currently using um, an 80 quart aluminum stock pot. It's huge. The biggest pot you've ever seen. Um, <laughs> and but the nice thing about it is that it was really easy for us to access, and then it also has the handles so that it can be transported very easily. And we also included in our design some uh, fins so that we could facilitate the heat transfer from uh, salt to the surface. And um, our team did some analysis on optimizing that. It's it's primary at this point, so we're still looking into it. Um, as we move into the next phases of our project. And I'm going to pass it over to Lineker, who's going to talk about some of the research that we did on uh, the salt and figuring out how to optimize uh, that balance. Hello. Um, so, on the, on the left, we have the base change graph. So, this 
graph represents the different ratios that we have for the, the salt mixture. So if you go all the way to the left, then it would be 100% sodium nitrate. And if you go all the way to the right, it would be 100% potassium nitrate. So my experiment was to experiment with different ratios of salt to see which would yield the best properties. And the best properties were came from a 60-40 ratio, where it was 60% sodium nitrate and 40% potassium nitrate. So, for the two pictures in the middle, the salt on the right will be in the 60-40 on those hot plates, and then the one on the top is a 28 ratio, and the one on the bottom will be a 40-60 ratio. And what we found was that these different ratios would not work as well as the 60-40 because it would not completely melt. So let's say it took two hours to completely melt the 60-40 ratio, and it would take a far longer, significant amount of time to melt the other ones, or if they would even melt at all, because for the ones that weren't 60-40 ratio, the bottom of the salt would be all melted, and then the top would just stay solidified because uh, the heat conductivity was not enough to melt everything. And on the right over here is a solidified block of 60-40. And we found that the volume change from a liquid phase to a solid phase, the volume decreased by around 3%. And Carlotta was talking about the heat in this time. So we've all had pie before, like cooking in the oven. And let's say we take out the pie and we let it sit on the counter. And it, as it cools, the outside would you know, go to room temperature. And once we, uh, we cut the pie, we look at the center, it's still really hot. So that's kind of the same principle with uh, salt that we're using. Once we take it off the heat source, it cools from the outside towards the core. So if we have our cooking surface on the outside of the salt, it would cool and then we won't be able to get all the heat that we want. So what we had to do was use heat fins to draw the heat out to the cooking surface. So the best way to do that was using thermal couples to see where all these, uh, where it was hottest in this uh, salt medium. And we would put fins in that area to draw all the heat to the surface. And look at the right picture, it says a TC that stands for thermal couples. And this is actually our experiment with a uh, cylindrical geometry looking at the Okay, and on the left is uh, our experiment without insulation. You can see that uh, they're pretty spread out. See, every uh, line on that graph represents a thermal couple. And once we use insulation, the heat would uh, increase and stay increased a longer period. And you can see on the right. So what we found that is that the more condensed these lines are, the more uniform the heat is at the, you know, bringing it up to the cooking surface. So another team member did a observation about um, different solar collectors. And we found that the one axis solar collector was best for our applications. And they also surveyed the area in Irvine to see which angle provided the best or the most amount of sunlight. And then for our new prototype, what we wanted to do was keep it stationary as possible. So we're actually going to have the solar collector facing upwards and having a mirror in the center to focus all the light down to the solar collector as you can see on the left. So, I mean, pretty much the new design is that we have two concentrators. We have a, a dish at the bottom and then a secondary dish uh, facing back down. 
I would say that we run out of time. This is a lot of work that we got through in the 18 of six in a year, so 15 minutes isn't enough. But the future plans is to test this building, and I'm actually building it right now in the summer uh, for my master's project, and trying to see, can we cook with it? Are we getting the heat that we want, the temperature that we want? Um, and we're really excited. So hopefully by September, we'll have like a video show of us cooking some more, like chapati or boiling rice. Thank you so much for your time.